You're listening to Live from Lord North Street, a podcast from the Institute of Economic Affairs. I'm Kate Andrews, Associate Director at the IEA. In any society, there are elite positions that command a high income, and more importantly, high status. Unsurprisingly, there's intense competition for these positions. But what happens when a society turns out more qualified people for these roles than the number of roles actually on offer? On this week's podcast, the IEA's Head of Education, Dr. Steve Davies, joins me to discuss what he calls the overproduction of elites in society. The problem, he explains, is that elitism, unlike many things, is a zero-sum game. To be in the elite means you are not like 90% or more of the population as a whole. As a result, the ever-increasing number of UK university graduates or American PhD students leads to bitter resentment towards those with similar qualifications who have managed to secure elite jobs. Steve talks about how elitism affects our views of a fair society, what it means for the concept of meritocracy, and how we go about as a society addressing perceived issues of unfairness. Steve, thanks for joining me today. I want to ask you about this idea doing the rounds that developed economies are struggling with the problem of elite overproduction. Can you explain what this means? Well, this is an idea that is very familiar to historians, and it's a number of historians, in fact, who have argued that on the basis of historical comparisons, elite economies currently are seeing this phenomenon, elite overproduction. The basic idea is very simple. In any society or social political order, there are a certain number of positions, whether it be in government, in the media, in commercial life, which are elite positions. These are positions which typically command very high income, but more importantly than that, they also have very high status. Uh, The people who hold these positions are seen in some sense as being the leadership caste or the the literal elite, uh, the best of that society. So, not surprisingly, uh, there's obviously intense competition to get those positions. Now, in any society, there is typically a kind of process by which the elite is replenished, by which people are recruited and brought into that elite to replace people who've left it for one reason or other, death, disgrace, decline, whatever it might, failure, whatever it might be. Now, the way in which the elite is produced varies enormously. In some societies, it's literally a matter of physical reproduction. Uh, Aristocrats go and have lots and lots of children, uh, and those children then inherit their positions in the aristocratic hierarchy and maybe the church. Uh, It may be, on the other hand, done through the educational system, which is the way increasingly it's done uh, in the contemporary developed world. Historically, there have been yet other ways in which it's been done uh, through various kinds of selection process. Now, the problem is that the number of elite positions may expand slightly as the economy grows and as the population grows for reasons like that. But ultimately, it's always fixed. And there's a simple reason for that. Because by definition, not everyone can be elite. If a position which confers elite status suddenly becomes held by everyone, then by definition, it is no longer elite. To be in the elite means that you are not like 90% or more of the population as a whole. Now, what that means, therefore, is, as I say, there's always a limited and constrained number of elite positions. It may expand, but it's not going to expand that rapidly. Uh, Now, elite overproduction means that the production process in any given society, whatever it is, is turning out simply too many people who are qualified for elite positions in one way or another, uh, given the number of positions that there actually are. And so what you end up with is two things. On the one hand, increasingly intense and frantic, even desperate competition to get into the elite and to be qualified to get into it. And on the other hand, an increasingly large number of qualified people who are disgruntled, angry and bitter because they've typically invested a significant amount of time and effort and then not got the rewards uh, that they expected to get. Wow. So elitism is a zero sum game. Uh, And not everybody gets to fall into that category. Pretty close, yes. As I say, when the economy is growing rapidly or when the population is growing, 
uh, then the the number of elite positions does tend to rise. But that's an unusual situation. Normally it is. And one way of understanding it in economic terms is that being in the elite is what economists call a positional good. And a positional good is something that only benefits you to the extent that relatively few other people have it. Uh, the famous example is if you're watching a football game in a stadium and you stand up to get a better view. As long as you're the only person standing up, you get a better view. But as soon as other people start to stand up pretty rapidly, the better view that you've got disappears. Mm -hmm. Hence, it's called a positional good. And in some senses, being in the elite is a positional good of that kind. Uh, as long as you're the only one in 10 who's got the positional good, you're fine, you're part of the elite. But if suddenly 50% of the population are qualified for that positional good, you're facing much more intense composition and you're not going to get the benefit so much. My mind is exploding. I feel like this is going against so many sort of moral and ethical and intellectual principles I had, which we'll get to. But first, I want to ask from the historical perspective, has this ever happened before and what happened? Uh, many times. Uh, for example, take the 11th century, uh, Europe at that time was facing a major problem of elite overproduction from the purely biological fact that the warrior aristocracy were producing way too many sons who were surviving to adulthood. And those sons uh, invested typically a very large amount of time and money, forget it not, uh, in becoming warrior knights. Trouble was there weren't enough castles, fiefs, <laughs> government positions, king's favourite positions for all those young knights. So what were they doing? Well, the answer is they were roaming around Europe, killing each other and killing people, and generally making themselves a total ruddy nuisance. Uh, the Pope, uh, Pope Urban, hit on uh, a solution, you might say, which was to say that there was a need for a huge war to recapture Jerusalem from the, the Muslims, and a whole bunch of these uh, surplus knights were packed off to Outremer, to the Holy Land, uh, or later on to Eastern Europe to fight the Slavs or the Muslims. Steve, this is not the solution I was looking for. No, that's, that's, that's a bad message. Here's another case. Uh, in 17th century England, in the first part of that century, uh, the two universities of Oxford and Cambridge were producing way more lawyers and also qualified divines, um, ministers in other words, than there were positions for in either the Church of England or the courts of law at the time. So you ended up again with a surplus supply of young qualified lawyers uh, and uh, theologians many of whom then couldn't get anything other than totally miserable positions as curates uh, or trying to scrape out and eke out a living as extremely badly poor lawyers. What did they do? Well, they became politically radical. A few years later, you get an enormous political explosion, which ends up with the king having his head cut off. Steve, also not the solution I was looking for. That, that, I'll give you another bad case in point, unfortunately. Uh, France in the second half of the 18th century. Uh, during that period, there's an enormous expansion again of qualified elites, the so-called noblesse de robe. Uh, these are people who are qualified for holding public office, typically by virtue of having a law degree, but sometimes through other means. Uh, the problem is that the noblesse de robe, the people who get noble status by working for the king, holding public office, which was typically bought, by the way, finality of office was one of the major sources of revenue, for the French crown, there's just way too many of them. Uh, and a lot of these people then again become extremely disgruntled. Uh, certain people like Robespierre, for example, Danton, two leading Jacobins, major figures in the terror and the French Revolution, they were disappointed aspiring young lawyers who had wanted to get government positions uh, but were not able to do so because essentially the French state was bankrupt and also there just weren't enough positions to go around. Now I'm afraid the lesson to draw from this is that elite overproduction is potentially very very dangerous. It does not typically end well because what it does is to create a large body of smart driven ambitious people who have, they think, done what it takes to get an elite position and who suddenly have found that it hasn't paid off. And not surprisingly, they're typically rather disgruntled. And this tends and they to can lead, do something about and it. And they can do something about it because they have the links, the connections, the skills, the knowledge to actually do it. So what in fact typically happens is that people like this either cause trouble themselves or they put themselves at the head of uh, radical political movements of one kind or another and they cause a lot of trouble.
And it sounds like people's heads usually roll, Steve, and quite literally. So before we get to how this has manifested itself in 2018, I want to talk about sort of the underlying principles of this. Because, I mean, I'm, as I said, my, my, my mind is exploding because as a liberal, as someone who believes in the individual and in a self-starting mentality, uh, in a free market, I have to believe that if you work hard, and you do what's required of you, that you can be successful. I mean, that is the message that we put mm. out. Is that not the case? No, that is true. Uh, the problem is how success is defined. Because the crucial thing here is that the elite positions which are being oversupplied with candidates are typically not simply market positions. Uh, what you find in a market economy, which has a rule of law and um, has good laws as well, is that if you work hard and you have talent and you provide services which are good for other people, you will be successful. You will gain higher income than you would otherwise have. What you may not get, however, is social status. There are lots and lots of people who are very economically successful, but who don't have high social status necessarily. Uh, the uh, problem is that you have certain sectors where uh, you not only get high income, or maybe you, you don't actually get high income, but what you do get is very high social status. But that social status is dependent on there not being a lot of people like you. Mm -hmm. And historically, that used to be the aristocracy and a number of related professions, and you typically had to be either born into it, or as happened in 18th century France, there were another routes into it. Today, it's done through the uh, principle of meritocracy, which is the idea that the way to achieve these high status uh, positions is essentially through academic attainment. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing anything particularly useful, I have to say, having been in the academic profession myself. So it's a question of working hard at what? Uh, if you're working hard at providing services and things that make other people's life better, yes, Undoubtedly, if you're in a functioning market economy, you will do better. You will become better off. You will become, in some sense, part perhaps of the economic elite, but you may not become part of the social elite. Whereas access to the social elite, uh, the social register, if you will, uh, is much more exclusive. And that is something like a zero-sum game. In fact, at the moment, it, it, being economically successful may very well work against you, as capitalism is not particularly trendy. It's the opposite, that that is bringing up that social status. We did a podcast not all that long ago with Christian Nemitz from the IEA, and we were talking about free speech and things. And he brought up this idea of, of virtue signaling and how actually one of the reasons that, um, you know, Generation Snowflake has popped up, that the escalation of platforming has popped up, and that things are becoming radically, dare I say it, more woke, is because in order to signal your virtue, you need to be better than the average. And as people have become more enlightened on issues like women's rights and gay rights and the rest of it, to signal that you are particularly virtuous, you have to keep shifting what it means to be virtuous to a more extreme position. Is that similar to one's yes. actual social status? Absolutely. That's exactly the kind of process that you see happening as well. It's the same social dynamic at work. So, for example, when the number of aristocrats increased in the later part of the Ancien Regime, because the decline of the death rate meant that more and more aristocratic children were surviving to adulthood, um, this means that increasingly the number of aristocrats is growing and growing. It's becoming like, you know, you know they're to a penny, basically, uh, which destroys the whole point of being an aristocrat, really. At that point, what the reaction is to re-emphasize and double down on the exclusivity and the peculiarity of being a nobleman. So that what you get in the late 18th century, not just in France, but notably there, is the so-called feudal revival, which is an enormous attempt to revive all kinds of noble privileges, uh, the things that distinguish nobility from the third estate, the commoners. And so it's exactly the same process, just as the the way to show that you are more virtuous involves ever more extreme demonstrations of purity and moral probity. Uh, so when you have a problem of elite overproduction, in order to show that you are in the elite, you have to have ever more dramatic or extreme ways of showing that you're not like those other people. And in particular, of distinguishing yourself from the merely wealthy. Uh, so, for example, 
People who are skilled tradesmen, plumbers, electricians, bricklayers and the like, earn as much money as people who are in certain elite professions, more in many cases. So how do those elite professions distinguish themselves from the sordid, merely rich, the ones who are rich but not elite? They do it by, for example, having tastes, cultural affectations, cultural interests, which are not shared by those people. Political... Uh, affectations as well or affectations of outlook or of speech or manner all they're all ways of identifying yourself as being part of the elite and not hoi polloi Uh, so the process is exactly the same it's what the sociologists call the process of status differentiation Uh, the status being moral purity in the case that Christian is talking about, uh, social status and rank in the case that I'm talking about. And perhaps this is where some legitimate criticisms come in about networking and nepotism in particular, that it isn't necessarily a meritocracy that's getting people into the top jobs and getting people into the top circles, that we do have a lot of qualified people graduating from from some of the best universities, getting great jobs, but at the end of the day, If you know somebody and your family knows somebody, they can help promote you because it is a zero-sum game. Others who might be just as qualified, if not more qualified, aren't going to be in those positions. Well, there's three things to say there. The first thing is that the whole point about there being too many people qualified for the number of elite positions that there actually are means that by definition, a lot of people are going to be disappointed. The second point is that um, that is always the problem with the supposedly meritocratic system. It falls foul of certain ineluctable features of human nature and the way we live as a species, I'm afraid. Most notably the fact that we are a family species. Mm -hmm. And people have an enormously powerful urge to help and assist uh, their children and their close relatives. You can argue about where this comes from, but as a sociological fact, it's undoubtable, indubitable. Now, what that means is that if you want to have a pure meritocracy, you've got to abolish the family, basically, which is why the idea is never going to actually work. In practice, people will find ways of gaming the system. In addition also, to the extent that the competition for elite positions becomes more and more intense, what you will find is ever more frantic ways of getting an edge over the competition. And these tend to be more accessible to and more available to the people who are already at the top, so you don't get it. However, having said that, even in the kind of purely hypothetical case of a pure meritocracy, I think that would actually be deeply objectionable because the fundamental objection to this from a liberal point of view, a classical liberal point of view that is, is the underlying assumption that certain kinds of social role, certain kinds of social position are ethically superior to or better than others. It's the idea that certain kinds of work, for example, have a higher status, are more morally worthwhile, more virtuous, more dignified than others. And that's the idea that the great liberal thinkers in the 19th century all rejected. If you read people like Samuel Smiles, for example, uh, the famous author of Self-Help, but read many of his other books like Life and Work or Thrift, what Smiles is arguing is that what matters for the reputation, the standing, the social status of somebody should be their qualities of character, their qualities of the way they live, not the kind of work they do, uh, certainly not the income they get, not the kind of occupation that they have. So you may be the most humble street sweeper, but you should have the same dignity and the same respect for the work that you do as, say, someone who is called to the bar. Uh, It should not be the case that merely by virtue of being a lawyer, you have a higher status, you have greater respect paid to you than if you are say, a humble street sweeper uh, or a rat catcher. Work itself of any kind that is productive should bring equal status. And so what the it seems to me that the classical liberal idea is is the idea of the equal moral worth and social status of all kinds of productive work. Uh, now, people will get different monetary rewards. That's the nature of a market economy. Uh, But that doesn't mean that you should therefore think that certain kinds of occupation or ways of making a living bring not only higher income, but also uh, social kudos and higher status. Well, indeed. Um, And that concept of essentially no judgment, that what people choose to do should not define who they are and what they're really contributing to the world overall. Um, But, I mean, that's a big cultural fight that classical liberals have on their hands. It's not actually how people often treat each other when they meet someone at a dinner party or in a big room. You know, that's they they don't they care about what's on the business card. I mean, that's just the reality we live in. But this might this might be silly, but just an idea. I mean, is is the younger generation? 
generation today kind of surpassing this in a way through access to social media. So it doesn't matter if you are a bricklayer or working in a working at a checkout point or if you're a lawyer or a doctor or a superstar. If you have something interesting to contribute through Twitter or Instagram, you might well, actually very very often people do rack up quite a following and there's mm -hmm. a social status in that. Now, I appreciate that might not transcend to people in their 60s and 70s who aren't using these platforms as much, but um is it you know is it ridiculous to be optimistic that we are finding new technological ways in which people are able to feel valued that that their contribution isn't directly connected to their job occupation or uh historical status uh no it's not wrong to feel optimistic about it but i don't think it's to do with the technology actually i think actually the technology is simply reflecting something else because when I when you have the situation I described of elite overproduction, one response by many people, as I said, is to become extremely angry and antsy at the way they've been, as they see it, let down by the system. And this typically has very bad political effects. But the other way of responding is to actually say, well, you know, this is a crazy chase anyway. Why should I be killing myself to get something just to get higher social status. That person down the road is just as good as me. I'm just as good as them. Why not treat everybody on a basis of social equality and see who's got something interesting to say? So that's the more constructive response. And in fact, that is what you do find historically. After you have the upheavals or the explosions brought about by discontented would-be elites, what you actually find is a backlash or a response in which people do go down the route you describe. And I think we can already see this starting to happen. Now, if you think about the world we're in at the moment, um, do we have a problem of elite overproduction? Oh, my God, yes, because our university system in particular is turning out a stupendous amount of graduates, way more than there are actually positions of the supposedly appropriate level for those graduates to go into. So just like 18th century France, we are producing a absolute ton of people who are candidates, qualified candidates for elite positions, who are not going to get one of those positions because there's simply too many of them. To do the simple numbers, um, the United States graduates a thousand history PhDs every year. Total number of faculty positions opening in any one year, if you're lucky, 200. Wow. Now, that is a very small example. If you look at things like the law school industry in the United States, they're graduating something like four lawyers for every job in the law industry. Uh, now, that is simply not sustainable. So in the short run, it's going. To, what we're going to see is a lot of disappointed and probably pretty angry people. And this will have all kinds of interesting political um, implications. But in the longer run, and I think we can see it starting already amongst the post-millennial generation, people will take a much more chilled out, you might say, and ultimately much more healthy view of things. Uh, and they will, in fact, start to treat people much more on the basis of what are they bringing to the table? What do they have interesting to say or do? Uh, and become much less aware of uh, this sort of constant frantic competition for status and hierarchy. Now, you're quite right. We're never going to get away from this. I think it's part of our nature as an animal that we are high hierarchy, state conscious, status conscious creatures. Uh, the old, you know, we're too close to our baboon and great ape uh, relatives to uh, not not have that. But that doesn't mean that our social life and our social institutions have to be driven by it to the degree that they are at the moment and have been at certain episodes in the past. All right. Well, I'll take that optimistic note, Steve, but you still totally rattled me. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Thank you. If you like what you hear, subscribe to our iTunes channel, IA Conversations.